welcome to another edition of Leading Edge here on WTOL 11. I'm Jeff Smith. Glad to have you with us and inviting in today an old friend, somebody who uh, I've done many interviews with over the plus years. My goodness, 20 plus for me, 25 plus for you at the helm of Sylvania. Mayor Craig Stow joining us here on Leading Edge. Good to see you. Good to be back. If somebody, I'm going to start off with my last question and I'm going to go right to the top. If, if somebody had told you 26 years ago that you were going to be taking over the helm of Sylvania mayor for that long, what would you have said to them? I never would have believed I'd be there this long. I've had a great time at it. Um, it's, it's a great place to be. You don't have to go to Columbus. You don't have to go to Washington. You step out your front door and you're, you're doing good for the community. Yeah. I've met so many good people both inside and outside the city. It's just, it's the best job in Northwest Ohio, and I'm very fortunate to still have it. And, and, and it's one of those understandings for people as well. Part-time position, obviously, is far, but sometimes feels full-time, I'm sure. You're mayor 24-7, but <laughs> you don't work at it 24-7. You worry about it 24-7, yeah. but no, it's a great job to have. A lot yeah. of changes over the years. Oh, lots of changes. I grew up in Sylvania, went to high school at Sylvania High, high School. and the When downtown, there was one. <laughs> when there was one, before it became Northview. Yeah. And it's to see all the changes and to see my classmates come back and try to put things in perspective of where we come from. Yeah. It's a great thing to do. I love it. I got to ask you, while you bring up the schools, and, and I, I just, while I've got you here, I've got to ask as far as the busing issue that is being uh, talked about. I know on the streets of Sylvania, a lot of people talking about that. Just found out today as we're taping here on Thursday, it's going to federal court oh at this point. Any take on that at all, Mayor? Um, we... Sylvania's because this, no. is nothing, this is nothing new to have parochial kids getting busing to schools, correct? Right. Well, it hasn't always been that way. It's been a couple decades. They didn't even get that. But you can't take little kids, I don't think, and expect them to take twice as long to get to their schools. You know, they're not saying it's a budget issue. They're saying that it's a get enough school bus drivers issue. And I'm sure they're going to do the best they can to find the best solution. I wish it wasn't spending time in the courts, but... They need to find a better solution, and I'm sure they will. Yeah. They'll come up with the best they can. Yeah, I understand. I thank you uh, for talking about that. Our, let, let, let's talk a little bit. We, we talked about all the changes that have happened over the years, the 26 that you've been in office. But right here, right now, and I wanted to bring you on to kind of Give a grade card. Now that we're back at school, I wanted you to act the role of, uh, of teacher here today with me on Leading Edge. And look at the SOMO project, which for people who don't know, who aren't familiar with Sylvania, you guys took it upon yourself over the last decade or so to really develop the area south of Monroe Street. That's what that stands for. That is. It's the third project that we worked on there. The first was the hotel. The other one was the office building on the south side of 10 Mile Creek. What are we looking at right here? These are some of the new that condos, That looks like an apartments. area picture. There's two buildings there. You're flying over the west building, looking towards the east building. There's 213 apartments in there, and they are being very successful as a business venture. They're, they have high occupancy rate. Some people have lived there for a year. Uh, there are leases being renewed. I've had somebody tell me they're glad they had a multi-year lease mm -hmm. because the lease rates are going up. Yeah. So. I think people are really happy there, but it's a great success for our downtown. We assembled some parcels of land that were either unused or underused and waited for the right development to come along and the right developer to come along. And with this project, we've repopulated the downtown in a great way. It's great for Sauter's supermarket, but it's also great for the whole downtown block. Restaurants are busier, shops are busier, a lot more activity downtown. They come to the Friday night art walks. They come to all the festivals downtown. I consider SOMO to be a great success. Downtown living at its best. That's what you're, I, that's what you're kind of advertising. Right. For years, I'd have people come to me, people that were retiring and moving out of their houses saying, we want to live close to the downtown. We want to walk to the library. We want to walk to the bank. We want to walk to Sauter's. And there really wasn't a good place to, to do to it. walk to St. Joe's. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Well, now there is. Yeah. And we were surprised by how many empty nesters there are in there. We were told oh, it's going to be a lot of young professionals. No, there's a lot of empty nesters that are living in there, and they're really happy. because. How do you grade it? How do you grade it when you look at it? On, on, on a scale of, okay, we went into it with this idea, we went into it with that idea, but what did you get out of it? I think the city's done really well with it. The, there's, there's income tax dollars that are there, which was always has to be a goal. You don't get as many of those from the empty nesters, but we've got a lot of other people in there as well. Um, the riverfront has always been something that needed to be developed in Sylvania. We had a, we had a bulk oil storage facility there when I was a kid, 
and Howard Gas and Oil and dilapidated buildings. We've always wanted to develop our right. riverfront and this is a gorgeous building from the park side. If you walk along our river trail and look up at this thing, it's very articulated. It's the right scale for our downtown. It's the right architectural yeah. look for our downtown. And we've got a lot of people safely living there, happy to be where they're at. It yeah. just couldn't be better. And yeah, we saw actually some of the video that we're showing you here today, that uh, drone video that we shot this week, showed yes. the river walk, which is yeah. right uh, behind some of those buildings that have been uh, put up. And that goes all the way to, uh, to 475, 20, or actually it, U.S. 23 goes, right there. goes across the Flower Hospital campus under U.S. 23 and comes up over at Monroe Street. Yeah. It's a safe, nice way to bike or walk and get across U.S. 23. As we talk a little bit more about going down that way, heading east out of downtown and the U.S. 23 Monroe Street overpass project, talked about for years, Mayor, I think uh, going back to maybe some of the first times you and I ever met to do some interviews, and yeah. the state had looked for a long time at how busy that interchange is. What are your thoughts today? What are you thinking is going to happen there? Because the project, as we understood, was on, now it's off again. Oh no, it's not off. It was, we were gonna rebuild the bridge last year. Right. And we were making plans how to close that bridge and have safety services and people get around. No, we were fortunate to come across $35 million of ODOT and federal money to rebuild that intersection. So we delayed the bridge recross rebuilding for this. You're showing a video of it right, right now and the ramps are gonna be changed so we don't have three traffic lights east of US 23. There's gonna be one traffic light it's going to come up. Alexis Row is going to come into a cross intersection. So that little diamond or that little triangle area, is that going away? Or? Most of that's going to go away. Okay. It's going to be a new straighter ex exit ramp coming off of there. And there's going to be one traffic light you go through on Monroe Street or on Alexis. It's going to be a cross intersection. Traffic's going to move a lot faster and a lot safer there. And no, it's on track. Okay. Uh, it's going to cost, we have to pay a minimum of 10% local funds to do it, so we're putting $3 million into it, but it's a $35 million project, and it just, it's going to be Carmageddon, I think, when it happens. <laughs> That's a term I picked up in California, but good will come of it. Yeah. It's going gonna, it's gonna to help with more development, more people will move through that intersection easier, but think of all the traffic that goes through there. Mm -hmm. When Sylvanians go to work and get on 23, they don't have to go across that bridge, but coming home, Everybody has to come across that bridge. They turn left on a Monroe Street and come across. That's, that's the slowdown. Yeah. And that's going to be greatly accelerated with this new intersection design. Bring me up to speed as far as the design of that overpass. Are we looking at something similar to what we see on Central Avenue, or are we seeing something similar to what we see down in Perrysburg? Neither one. Okay. It's, it's going to be specifically made for that, and there's going to be a big off-ramp coming up from US 23 with turn lanes left, directly onto Monroe Street to move people through that intersection quicker. Okay. Um, those other intersections are, you know, a, a cross intersection. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, though. Did the pandemic put the brakes on this for some time? No, it really didn't. Okay. It's the funding cycle. We're waiting for 2025. It's going to be a big project then. It's in design. They're getting the right-of-ways straightened out now. Um, but the, the slowdown was we got funded for more. That's what slowed down the project. Gotcha. Gotcha. Mayor, as you as you look forward, uh, as far as the progress of your town, and we had a meeting earlier this week where you brought in a number of people to kind of pick their brains a little bit about the design of the downtown and how that goes forward. My question to you today, I, I grew up in Sylvania. We talked about that before we ever came on here. And at the time, there was a lot of building space. There was a we weren't necessarily landlocked out there. How, how do you grow downtown Sylvania? With do you, is it out with the old, in with the new? Well, it's a lot of new people, good people with good ideas coming in there and saying, "I want to be a part of this downtown because it's growing." We've got more people in the downtown because of SOMO, but we've got an art festival that goes on the first Friday of every week. Mm -hmm. We've got festivals, festivals that come in there, and there's good places to eat and shop in downtown Sylvania. So. Businesses do get bought out. When I was in high school, most of the west side of uh, Main Street from the midpoint on was a auto parts and tire storage facility. That's not a highest and best use for a downtown. Mm -hmm. And earlier city councils and Jim Sini, my predecessor, went after that. And in 1982, they redid the downtown streetscape, which was at that time an unusual step to take. You didn't see that in many small cities. And, and they did a lot of good. They put in those fancy street lights and did some facade improvements. 
and we've benefited from that. And there's so much new activity downtown, but that stuff's 40 years old. Right. It's time to freshen it up, put in new trees. The trees are dying because they're so old. Yeah. And make it ADA accessible. That's a really big part of what we're doing. And that gives us the opportunity to look at traffic flow through there. How do we want walkability? What's the parking gonna be? Are we gonna try to increase parking or maybe take it down a little bit? What is the experience of being in downtown Sylvania going to do to improve it? That's what we took comments on at a recent meeting. And if you want to hear more about those comments, you can check out the story that we aired earlier this week at WTOL.com. Another meeting you said comes up in January. January. We're going to take all the good ideas that we got and yeah. all the people saying, I like this, I don't like this. The designers will go back, they'll work on it the next few months, and we're going to schedule a meeting right after the first of the year to show them the first yeah. pass through it. Let's see, how do you like this? Give us some more comments grade this for us. Uh, and I want to come in here that we've wanted to do this for a long time, but it's the American Rescue Plan funding that's allowing us to take this on now. We've got $2 million worth of funding that City Council has agreed to dedicate to the downtown. Uh, we've got a TIF that we could put in there, and we're going to fund this project to grow our downtown. The down, the Sany is known for a lot of things, great schools, great recreation programs, but it's starting to be known for the quality of its downtown. People yeah. like to come Mayor. and we got to keep growing. If you don't, if you're not improving, you're going backwards. So Mayor Stahl here has got 26 years in. You got another 26 in you? Oh, I hope so. <laughs> I got doubt that. Wow, you heard it here first. <laughs> Craig, good to see you. Thank you My so pleasure. much. Thank we'll be back you, with John. more right after this. All right. Welcome back here on Leading Edge. I want to bring in my next guest, Brian Blair, new athletic director for the University of Toledo. Good enough to join us. You may have seen him earlier this week on the Your Day program at 9 on uh, WTOL here in weekdays. Good to see you. Yeah. Welcome. Thanks for having me. I, I feel like this is home now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Talk to me a little bit about the whirlwind it's been. And I, I want to jump into a lot of game week preparation. And obviously, we got a big game coming up Thursday night. Talk about the whirlwind for you, the fresh set of eyes coming in, and what you have taken in as far as what you Toledo is about. Yeah, I started about three and a half months ago. I um, just completed my first 90 days. Um, part of that personally is getting my family settled. Mm -hmm. Wife's from Dayton, Ohio, so it made the transition a little bit easier. But getting I was her, born in Kettering, so we've got we can share some stories. There you go. <laughs> so getting her and the kids settled yeah. in daycare and all those kind of things and finding their way around. Then professionally, okay, meeting all the people, meeting all the stakeholders, meeting this community mm -hmm. that's so passionate about Rocket Athletics and saying, okay, what are we doing really well? And there's a whole lot of it. Um, and then what are those things we can do slightly better to take ourselves to the next level? And that's where we're at now, is trying to put these pieces together and take things to the next level. You call it a gold mine, a blue and gold mine yeah. for you guys coming in and seeing all of the accolades which have been handed down over the last year. This week, we, we talked about not only the Cartwright Award, the best men's and women's athletics programs for the entire Mid-American Conference. And that, that includes, one of the things that really stood out to me, Brian, you can comment on it as well. Obviously, championships to talk about. Spring and fall GPA banner moments for the athletes, but also citizenship awards. Yeah, I think that's a testament to all that came before me. I told the staff the other day, I'm happy to celebrate that with them. I wasn't here when that was earned. Yeah. Uh, Mike O'Brien and the coaches and the staff and the student athletes that were here did a tremendous job of setting this foundation in place. But to be the best, not only athletically, academically, and in the community, mm -hmm. I think it's the perfect example of what we want our young people to be and what we want our athletic department to be about. Um, so when I say gold mine, that's what I mean. Yeah. Um, it's a really good situation. This isn't a broken um, car or a burning house. Um, so I get to build on that foundation and see can we make it just a little bit better. I'm going to go for the, the repeat and the three-peat and after that. Take me back to your interview and, and, and what, sold, what were your moments that you're like, I can bring this to the table. I can do this for you of Toledo. Yeah, I, I think for, for so much of it, it was talking to my colleagues and peers around the country and everybody said Toledo's the best job in the MAC. I think that's unanimous in, in many circles. No of kidding. Athletic director across the country, yeah. they know about this brand. They know the quality of people that have been here, that are here, and what they've built over time. You look at some of our facilities and the success that we've had, I think as an athletic director coming in, you start there yeah. and build up. But that, that's kind of the floor, right? And I think for me, it was always that conversation of, and there's a business book I, I love to read called Good to Great. Mm -hmm. and it talks about taking a handful of companies that are really, really good and taking that elite status. And that's what I want to do, right? I, I want to take what's a really good product, um, really, really good. And let's, how do we be the best? How do we be the best in the G5? I mean, that's what our team and this community are all going to lock arms on and try to pull in the same direction to get to. And, and get those notoriety moments as well. Obviously, we've got the marquee programs. You talk football, you talk basketball. But the, the coaching that is available to all of these student athletes over on Bancroft, I mean, across the board, you, you had to look at that and say, 
we're headed in the right direction here as well. Yeah, you get excited as an AD yeah. uh, when you've got two basketball programs that, that have the regular seasons like they had. I mean, you got a football coach that's well known for his offensive acumen, and you got a number of other coaches that are either in really good spots or improving programs to get to where they really want to get to. Yeah. Um, so that's exciting when you've got those tools because that's who interacts with our student athletes um, on a daily basis. And it's really asking them. I spent a couple of days in Puerto Rico with Todd on the sport tour, mm -hmm. and I'm asking him, hey, what can we do for this basketball program? First conversation he, myself, and Trisha had um, was right after the tournament. Okay, how do we get the scheduling? Um, and what does that look like? And luckily, it wasn't me pushing them. Sure. They already had a plan in place that, hey, we want to look at last year and say, hey, how can we bolster those schedules to give ourselves multiple opportunities to have those notable moments? Right. You want that national level success. I think winning the MAC and doing those kind of things is really, really important. Um, but obviously, all of us in the Toledo and what it could do for the community. And building the brand. Level, absolutely. Building the brand. And th there are going to be moments over the next few weeks, even, where that's going to happen. You've got an opening game comes up a Thursday night match uh, at the Glass Bowl, home opener. And then in a few weeks, the parents' weekend down at Ohio State, guess who they welcome in? Yeah. University of Toledo. Yeah. So I, I tell everybody. On, so, on a national broadcast as it's well. A, it's our first time on a national network broadcast, 7 p.m. in the horseshoe. Everybody's going to be tuning in to watch the Rockets. Yeah, September uh, 17th. You've got that marked on your calendar, I'm sure. Absolutely. I'm excited for that one. Yeah. I think I, that's one of those games, too, you don't have to get the players excited. Mm -hmm. Coach Candle knows he's probably got a temper emotion more than anything, <laughs> right? Because those guys, all of them grew up and knowing something about Ohio State, no matter where in the country you came from, yeah. and to have that opportunity to test yourself against that caliber of talent um, and see how it plays out. Anything can happen on any Saturday. Yeah. I'll tell anybody that. I'm looking forward to watching our guys play. So I know they'll be ready. How do you get ready? How do you get everybody ready for this week? Or do you have to temper your own emotions in your department getting ready for this opening game? Probably a little bit of both, right? Yeah. There's nerves. I, when I say uh, we play next Thursday, uh, the anxiety kicks up when I say that out loud because um, that's not too far away. And we've got a lot of things that we're trying to get in order to make sure it goes off without a hitch. I've not seen a game day here. Um, so to do the coaching I want to do and work with our team yeah. to get it where we want, that, that's a hard task. Um, but I think we've got a really well-run machine. Um, that's done it for a while. Real, and our goal is that from week one to week two to week three to week four to get a little bit better each time gotcha. and build on what was done that last game to the next game. So the, the difference between the game LIU to UMass the following week, yeah. I hope is substantial because um, we're going to try to get better. We're going to take a break. We'll be back. We've got more to talk to with Brian Blair here in just a moment. Stay with us. Great conversation having with Brian Blair here, new athletic director at the University of Toledo. What's your checklist this week as you go into game week for not, not only staff, but also coaches, making them sure they're ready to go, even though you probably don't have to have much of a conversation with the coach. <laughs> yeah, I hope motivation in the factor. Yeah. I think it's more asking the right questions, um, being there to support, um, and trying to inspire confidence. I, I believe confidence is key yeah. um, to doing things in a major way. If we want to be big time, we got to treat ourselves big time. What about the game day experience yeah. for the fans? How, how, yeah. how important is that for you each week? It's huge. It's huge. You've got a lot of ways to spend your entertainment dollar. Um, here in Toledo, we've got lots of options, whether it be movie, imagination station, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. um, so I want you to spend a portion of that cheering on the Rockets. And I think when you do that, you'll have a product that you can bring your kids to, your family to, really enjoy and be a part of a larger community pulling in the same direction. Yeah, and obviously get out the word and build the brand a little bit yeah. as you look around the country. Uh, talk to me, I almost said coach, talk to me a little bit. <laughs> you like you, are, a, you yeah. are essentially a coach as far as athletics are, are concerned. Talk to me a little bit about... Uh, your, your read of the landscape as far as athletics is concerned going forward, your read on the MAC and, and, and the strength of this conference. Yeah, I mean, I love the MAC because of how close we are and how similar we are, right? Um, there's a lot to love and there's a collegiality um, that I think you have amongst the schools in the MAC. Um, so our plot right now, and I've told everybody this, regardless of the outside noise, is to be the best in the MAC at everything we do. Mm -hmm. And that starts from academics to fundraising to head football coach to janitor to AD. All of us need to look in the mirror and say, are we the best in the MAC? If not, what do we need to take to get there? Um, that's a plot for us early on. Um, the landscape is changing rapidly, right? you got Transfer Portal, NIL, all these different topics. Um, and we'll handle all those. We're going to be aggressive. We're going to be nimble um, and innovative in a lot of what we do. I think that's a, a, a core value of mine. Um, but at the same time, it still comes back to educating young people, higher education, and building a sense of pride in the community on a college campus in the city of Toledo. Do you and your coaches scratch your head at the, what's, you talk about the outside noise. Do you, do you monitor what's going on with the SEC, with the Big Ten, as far as those conferences are concerned and where, where things might be headed for them? Absolutely. I, I like to look around the corner. 
Um, and maybe that's my, my lawyer background. I'm always wanting to know what's coming before it actually hits you. Um, so we're looking around the corner and seeing, okay, what's happening in the Big Ten? What may be the trickle down? Um, when we watch conferences change, what may be the trickle down? Mm -hmm. And then we'll develop plans. We'll do scenario planning on each of those because my job is to make sure Toledo is always set up for success, I mean, even when you're walking into the unknown. So if that means planning for 15 scenarios, I'll do that to make sure that one scenario that does come true, we're not sitting on our heels waiting on somebody to dictate our future for us. We want to dictate the future for ourselves. I know you talked a little bit about it earlier this week, but we, let's talk a little bit more. Let's, let's give the game pitch as far as the yeah. game coming up on FIU on this Thursday night glass bowl kickoff. What do you expect as far as uh, the game day experience and what, what people can expect when they come out? Yeah, I expect a, a packed glass bowl. Um, I expect that, and I think we'll see that. I think we'll see students um, that have longed for a game day experience. We'll see a fan base um, that's excited to have football back in their lives. Um, on a Thursday, we get to kind of get ahead of everybody else, right? Yeah. There'll be a lot of games this weekend, but we'll be one of the first ones to kick off. Um, so come out, um, get that experience, and, and we'll put on a show. Um, I think you'll see some offensive fireworks and hopefully some fireworks in the sky too, signifying yeah. some of our touchdowns. Um, and, and we've got a team this year with a stacked front seven on defense and a really talented quarterback amongst a whole bunch of other offensive players. So we'll be an exciting team to watch. Awesome. Brian Blair, continued success. Thank Absolutely. you so much for spending some time with us, and uh, good luck coming up this Thursday. Once again, opening game at the Glass Bowl for your UT Rockets. Stay right there. We'll wrap things up for this week right after this. If you missed any of our conversation today with Sylvania Mayor Craig Stow or new athletic director from the University of Toledo, Brian Blair, be sure to check out our YouTube channel, WTOL YouTube channel. You can watch any of our past episodes of Leading Edge. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. I'm Jeff Smith. Make it a great rest of your day. We'll see you next time.